Welcome to our award-winning Consumer Finance Monitor podcast, where we explore important new developments in the world of consumer financial services and what they mean for your business, your customers, and the industry. This is a weekly podcast show brought to you by the Consumer Financial Services Group at the Ballard Spar Law Firm. I'm your host, Alan Kaplinsky, the former practice group leader for more than 25 years and now senior counsel of the Consumer Financial Services Group at Ballard Spar. And I will be moderating today's program. For those of you who want even more information, don't forget about our blog, consumerfinancemonitor.com. We've hosted our blog since 2011 when the CFPB became operational. And there's a lot of relevant industry content there. We also regularly host webinars on subjects of interest to those in the industry. So to subscribe to our blog or to get on the list for our webinars, please visit us at ballardspar.com. If you like our podcast, please let us know about it. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google, or wherever you obtain your podcasts. Also, please let us know if you have ideas for other topics that we should cover or speakers that we should consider as guests on our show. So today, uh, I am uh, happy to be joined by my colleagues, Rich Andriano, John Colhane, Mike Gordon, and Lisa Lanham. Rich is the practice group leader of our mortgage banking group and the co-chair of our fair lending team in our Washington, D.C. office. He assists clients with preparing for and handling CFPB mortgage-related examinations and enforcement actions and with a variety of mortgage-related regulatory issues. John Culhane is a partner in our Consumer Financial Services Group who works out of our Philadelphia office. He's known for his works on advising clients on interstate direct and indirect consumer loan and leasing programs. John's practice includes preparing clients for banking agency and CFPB compliance examinations and assisting in the defense of attorney general investigations and banking agencies and CFPB enforcement actions. Mike Gordon is a partner in our Consumer Financial Services Group based in our Washington, D.C. office. Mike is a former senior CFPB official uh, with over two decades of experience in consumer financial services law. Mike focuses on enforcement defense, compliance and exam readiness, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, And uh, uh, Mike is one of the two uh, new members of our Consumer Financial Services Group. Uh, When I say new, meaning that uh, they joined us last year. Uh, And finally, last but not least, uh, I'm happy to introduce Lisa Lanham, who is in our mortgage banking group and our consumer financial services group. And she co-leads our firm's fintech and payment solutions team. Her practices focuses on financial services matters related to state licensing and federal approvals that are necessary to conduct business for a variety of asset classes and market participants. So, Uh, On our podcast show last week, we covered a repurposing of a webinar that we recently did where we focused on the first of two registry proposals made by the CFPB. In the podcast show last week, we focused on the registry that the CFPB has proposed that would require non-banks that are in the consumer finance business to register with and submit information to the CFPB for publication in an online publicly available database. That that proposal, which we went into in detail last week, would require companies to register when as a result 
of any final judgment or otherwise or final settlement. Uh, those companies become subject to orders from local, state, or federal agencies and courts involving violations of consumer protection laws. Today, we are going to repurpose the other half of the webinar that we did, which focuses on the other CFPB registry proposal that would require companies to register if they use certain terms or conditions in form contracts, such as waivers of consumer rights and arbitration provisions, regardless of whether such terms or conditions are lawful. These two proposals, uh, either by themselves or together, represent a very aggressive attempt by the CFPB to enhance its supervisory and enforcement authority. Uh, we're now going to segue into uh, the second topic that uh, we're going to cover this afternoon, the so-called contracts registry. Uh, this was published in the Federal Register on February 1, uh, and comments are due on April 3rd. And uh, as is the case, with the so-called orders registry, uh, we are also working with a number of clients uh, who are interested in potentially submitting comments on this registry as well. In fact, I would say I've got probably, we have probably even more clients that are worried about this registry uh, because uh uh, this really is, I think, overreach on the part of the CFPB and uh, Rohit uh, Chopra. So the proposal would establish a system for the registration of supervised non-banks. Not all non-banks, such as, you know, uh, are covered under a good part of the um, registry dealing with orders, this applies to supervised non-banks, those that are subject to examination, that use certain terms or conditions that seek to waive consumer rights or other legal protections or limit the ability of consumers to enforce their rights. Wow, that covers a lot of language and a lot of form contracts. Um, however, this, in, in my view, and this is now Alan Kaplinsky editorializing, um, this is a, uh, I believe, uh, entirely a result of the, um, uh, the arbitration uh, or the lack of success that the CFPB had a while ago in uh, under a different director, uh, Richard Cordray, in uh, promulgating a regulation uh, that would have severely restricted arbitration by banning class action waivers and doing some other things. So e ever since Rohit Chopra got sworn in more than a year ago, as I say, we're going on 14, 15 months, uh, consumer advocates have been lobbying him. I should say that's probably not a, um, a forceful enough word. They've been beating down his door uh, to get him to ban the use of arbitration provisions or at least class action waivers contained in arbitration provisions in consumer finance contracts. Up till now, he wisely resisted that pressure because of the fact that of the experience that uh, former director Cordray had uh, to, in trying to get a regulation on the books that would have severely restricted the use of arbitration. And of course, uh, what happened there is that Congress utilized the Congressional Review Act uh, to override a regu the regulation that was promulgated by the CFPB, one of the final things that Richard Cordray did 
before uh, he left office uh, to go to Ohio to run for governor. But the Congressional Review Act, just so I can remind everybody, prohibits a federal agency from promulgating a regulation that is substantially the same as one that Congress has overridden uh, in a Congressional Review Act regulation. On November 1, 2017, then-President Trump signed into law a joint uh, Congressional Review Act resolution passed by the House and the Senate, overriding the CFPB's final arbitration rule that, number one, ban the use of class action waivers in arbitration provisions in consumer finance contracts, and two, this is even more important for purposes of where I believe Roe Chopra has gone off the rails here. It also required companies to report certain information about consumer financial services arbitrations involving such companies. In the CFPB's arbitration report on the, the study it conducted before proposing this final rule, the CFPB concluded the record did not support the promulgation of a rule that would altogether ban arbitration. So uh, what he came up with was the ban of class action, that he wanted to ban class action waivers in arbitration provisions, and he wanted to require companies that were using arbitration to report certain information to the Bureau about their use of arbitration. So, unfortunately, Director Chopra has caved in to the constant pressure of consumer advocates to ban class action waivers in arbitration provisions by proposing this registry for non-banks that are supervised by the CFPB that would require reporting to the CFPB and public disclosure about their use of arbitration provisions and class action waivers contained therein. Um, so the question at the second bullet point, if you uh, on this slide, this is re- really, I think, the important legal point, and that is, is the proposal an attempt by the CFPB to accomplish indirectly what Congress prevented it from doing directly when it disapproved the Bureau's final arbitration rule. That is, prohibit the enforcement of class action waivers in consumer arbitration agreements and also provide certain information about the use of arbitration. Uh, the authority relied on by the CFPB for this proposal is the same authority uh, used by the CFPB for the other registry. That is 1022 B and C of Dodd-Frank and 1024 B of Dodd-Frank. But here, I believe uh, that the CFPB is on shakier legal ground because, as I said, I think this is... Uh, a way for him to hopefully appease all the consumer advocates that have been clamoring for him to do something regarding arbitration, to not let that issue die. Uh, And uh, uh, this is what he came up with. And frankly, uh, I think, and and frankly, and unfortunately, uh, all the other things that um, uh, required disclosure uh, in this registry, uh, and we're going to get into that in more detail in a couple of minutes, Uh, they, I think, were put in there really just to make it appear as if this was not focused just on arbitration. But the reality is what's driving this, I believe, is arbitration and arbitration alone. But some of the other things he's asking for information about, that's going to require a lot of work and a lot of thinking. So let me now turn it over to Mike Gordon, 
uh, who's going to do a little more of a deeper dive into this particular registry. As you will learn about in a moment uh, in more detail, whether arbitration was the driving motivation or not, the covered provisions that this registry would require um, registration of go well beyond uh, arbitration clauses. Uh, but let's first deal with the question of who's covered by this. And I saw a question in the comments box by, from someone uh, who was understandably confused between what's a supervised entity versus a covered enti- non-bank entity for the purpose of this rule. And for this particular rule, it's focused on the companies that the the non-bank entities over which the Bureau already has supervisory jurisdiction through one of its uh, pre-existing means of doing that. Um, and uh, just briefly, uh, the, the tradition of the Bureau has a, a separate you know, supervisory jurisdiction over banks, but for non-banks, um, there are certain statutorily uh, dictated types of industry participants that, uh, that Congress gave the Bureau supervisory jurisdiction over. That's the first sub-bullet here. Um, secondly, they can write larger participant rules, carving out supervisory authority in new industries for the larger players in those industries. And they've done that for consumer reporting agencies, debt collectors, uh, and others. And then finally, they have this uh, uh, until recently dormant authority to pick individual companies that pose some perceived risk to consumers and exercise a a form of supervisory jurisdiction over them. So for the... um, for the terms and condition registry, that's who's covered, um, with some limited exceptions that are essentially threshold, like de minimis type exceptions. Um, when we were talking about the enforcement registry, uh, there were two parts to that. Remember, one part covered uh, att- required attestations, and that was for these supervised companies like we're talking about here. But the enforcement order registry also went broader than just supervised entities and had a covered non-bank dis- uh, definition that included many thousands more than are currently under the Bureau's supervisory jurisdiction that would be required to file the, their orders every year, but not necessarily the attestation. So it's a little confusing uh, to understand the Bureau's jurisdiction on a good day, uh, and this registry makes it a little more complicated. Uh, but... In essence, uh, for for this for this uh, terms and conditions registry, we're talking about supervised uh, non-bank entities. And I'll hand it over to to Rich at this point. Uh, thank you, uh, Mike. Now, what we're uh, going to look at is, in fact, uh, in, in who is covered is what is a covered form contract. Uh, And basically, it's a written agreement between a covered person and a consumer that was drafted before the transaction. That's key, one key element, drafted before the transaction, and then for use in multiple transactions, another key element, and contains a covered term or condition. That'll be the key, as Mike alluded to. uh, It's much broader than mandatory arbitration. And in fact, uh, we will be addressing that in a few slides. Now, in terms of this, uh, it can be in paper or electronic form. Now, as to electronic form, uh, the Bureau notes in the preamble uh, that, in fact, uh, let's say someone is uh, applying for a, a consumer financial product or service on the Internet and has to agree to website terms. Uh, those terms uh, perhaps could, in fact, be a covered form contract uh, if they have a covered term or condition in them. So uh, folks will have to think broadly in terms of what agreements in terms of conditions they have that might be covered uh, by by this rule. Now, uh, it might potentially, they, they say in the preamble, though don't go into a whole lot of detail, uh, if there's been an oral agreement and that is recorded or somehow reduced to writing, that potentially may be covered as well. It'd be nice to have a little more guidance on that. Now, let's look at the drafted prior to the transaction element. Bureau address said in the preamble, uh, really saying that has suggests two aspects. One, if it's drafted prior to a transaction, it suggests an intent to use it in multiple transactions. Uh, it also suggests that probably negotiation is not something that's possible on the part of the consumer, uh, given that it was done in it in advance, on essence, your typical type of, here's an adhesion contract. Uh, you you, could, you want to negotiate it? No, uh, but. But 
it isn't just completely take it or leave it contracts. One thing the Bureau does know, well, you might be applying for some sort of credit, and uh, there is an ability to negotiate with a lender on the cost of that credit. However, the document used to uh, implement the transaction, uh, there's no negotiation as to the terms there. Uh, there, even though there was negotiation as to the price, since there wasn't negotiation as to the other terms, it could still be a covered form contract if it has an applicable term or condition uh, in it. Uh, also, they said in, what, in some cases, uh, there may be certain ability to opt out or use alternate language, but when all of that is using provisions drafted by the creditor or other party, and the consumer has no input into what those provisions actually say, uh, again, even though there was some ability to change, perhaps from a standard version of the agreement to an alternative one that the entity uses, it would still be a covered form contract. To fall out of it, there has to be true negotiation. It's not something standard. And companies usually don't do that uh, simply for ease of operation. It's hard to have you 50,000 different versions of contracts uh, floating around. So that's why they usually are all standardized. Now, uh, another important exception here uh, for the mortgage industry, however, uh, as we know, with if you want to sell a loan to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, you have to use uh, their standardized documents unless you've negotiated a special transaction uh, with them. Uh, and also with uh, HUD, you know, FHA, they have up on their website, as Fannie and Freddie do on their websites, uh, various contract provisions and written modifications. And these are publicly available. Because of that, the Bureau said is, if your only use of a contract, covered form contract that includes covered terms or conditions. Are these agreements, because they are readily available to the public and the Bureau and consumers can just monitor what's in them and their use, that's excluded. Now, importantly, if you qualify for this uh, excluded, it only applies to these contracts. If you otherwise use covered form contracts in other manners, then it you would be subject to the registry. So again, website terms and conditions and other things might get pulled into this, uh, even if the only contracts used are the note, Fannie Freddie notes and, and security uh, agreements. And uh, they did, however, say though, if you know, there's an exception, but an exception to the exception. If a party, which would be a lender or service or holder, went to enforce a provision, a covered term or condition in one of these agreements, that would not be publicly known necessarily. So then the exception wouldn't apply and you would have to address the fact that you had, in fact, went in and sought enforcement of a provision. Now, the Fannie Freddie standard of uh, security instruments do have a notice of grievance provision. And basically that says on the part of either the loan uh, holder or the consumer, if either thinks the other party has breached the loan terms uh, before they may uh, go to court, they have to notify the other party of their belief of the breach and give the other party time to correct uh, the breach, if in fact there there is one, so there is a provision in there that would in fact uh, be covered. We think the notice of grievance, and lenders do at times seek to enforce those provisions when a borrower believes uh, the servicer perhaps didn't follow the security instrument, and they simply file suit without first notifying the servicer of the error. There are cases where the servicer will go into court uh, and ask uh, for enforcement of that provision. Now, not necessarily mentioned as a reason for the exception, but one thing we have to remember when it comes to the mortgage industry is they are subject to some contract restrictions that don't apply to other parties. Uh, in Dodd-Frank uh, provided, and the CFPB implemented it in Regulation Z under the Truth in Lending Act, that you can't have mandatory arbitration or similar clauses in mortgage agreements, nor can you have provisions where the consumer waives their right to seek damages or other relief under a federal law. So already the mortgage industry is subject to somewhat more limitations on the contracts they can use and the contract provisions that they can use. Uh, so that might have been part of the Bureau's thinking as well, perhaps, in offering up this exception, but they didn't specifically say that. Uh, now I'd like to hand it back to Mike to address when a supervised bank enters into a coverage. 
form contract. So the Bureau is trying to cast a wide net as possible here. They're clearly intending to be as thorough as they can uh, to capture the types of uh, provisions uh, as to which they have a great deal of skepticism. So whether there are provisions negotiated at the start of the relationship or added later um, or adopted by others in the course of the, the life cycle of the product or service, they're trying to capture uh, as much as they can. So the, this notion of a supervised non-bank, they, um, they, entered, they entered a, a, a covered form contract if, if it's at the front end when you provide a service that's governed by um, a cover form contract, um, if you provide a new product or service that has a pre-existing, uh, you know, offending provision here or, or contract, um, and, or if you acquire uh, a product or service that has that covered uh, contract as associated with it. Um, and they give examples of, in the auto industry. Um so uh, these are just, there are more examples of this, but this is just an indication of how broadly they're trying to cast the net for um, capturing co uh, the, uh, the contracts that they, they want to see reported. So here, again, if you add a provision later um, to an existing contract, that's one of the uh, provisions of interest that will bring you within the covered realm um, or, or add a, a covered form contract uh, to a service that, that already exists. So... Uh, again, the notion is, uh, and if this rule becomes final and any anything like this form, you'll have to be carefully reviewing your contracting processes and the contracts you acquire, um, and uh, and and draw draw lines around those that, uh, that for which registration is going to be required. And I'll hand it back over to John Colhain. So I'm I'm going to talk about what uh, are the provisions in your contract that are going to lead to you being subject here to having to register. And, and as Mike and Rich said, the CFPB has really cast a broad net here. I mean, if they mean what they said, um, they're going to be deluged with uh, contracts because it's going to get probably every website agreement. Um, it's probably going to get every closed-end loan um, note or credit agreement. Um, it, it's really extraordinarily broad and catches a tremendous uh, amount of, of contractual, uh, contractual provisions. So let's talk about what covered limitations are. Um, and it doesn't matter whether they're legally valid or enforceable. That's not what we're talking about here. So there are, I think, something like eight categories at this point of uh, uh, covered limitations and Contractual terms can and probably will fall into more than one category. Um, arbitration may fall into all of them. So at the start, at the outset, precluding the consumer from bringing a legal action after a certain period of time. And that's not just provisions that might shorten the statute of limitation or uh, pre-filing requirements that might have that same kind of effect or notification requirements. It's actually, right, right now, it's actually any deadline, uh, not just one that, that shortens the statute of limitation. Specifying a form or venue where a consumer must bring a legal action, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, limiting the ability of the consumer to file a legal action seeking, seeking relief for others or seeking to participate in a legal action filed by others. That's not just a class action waiver. That's a provision that might limit participation in a representative action, um, limit joinder of actions with, with other uh, ongoing cases, um, preclude intervening in an ongoing legal action or preclude consolidation uh, of an ongoing consolidation of cases uh, for an ongoing legal action. Again, really very broad. And keeping going, uh, keeping on, um, um, limiting liability by capping the amount of recovery or type of remedy. So, you know, provision that says um, no consequential damages or lost profits, um, very common in, in website agreements. Um, sometimes you see provisions that will limit recoveries uh, to the costs of goods or services that have been uh, obtained. 
But this also picks up liquidated damages clauses, uh, regardless of how much of an effort the creditor has made to appropriately estimate what those damages will be. Uh, they are deemed to be provisions that cap the amount of recovery or type of remedy. Waiving the cause of legal action by the consumer or stating that a person is not responsible to the consumer for harm or violation of law, uh, that's that's fairly straightforward. Um, but it, it, it's also very broad so that if you're uh, outside the scope of the holder in due course rule, but you might have a provision that um, operates to uh, waive or limit legal actions or recoveries, that's picked up. Uh, limiting the ability of the consumer to complain, to make any written, oral, or pictorial review, assessment, or other analysis or statement um, uh, about the offering or provision of the financial product or services. The CFPB acknowledges that there is a law that governs this, the Consumer Loan Review Fairness Act, and it has a lot of exceptions that it hasn't incorporated here. Um, it's purposefully not incorporated those exceptions, although it it's, uh, has agreed to accept comments on them. So anything of this sort, any non-disparagement clauses, um, any provisions that impose a penalty for that sort of thing. Um, sometimes you even see provisions that will grant intellectual property rights uh, in a review or statements or an analysis. Those are picked up as well. Um, continuing, we've got waiving, uh, whether by extinguishing or causing the consumer to relinquish or not agree to assert any other identified consumer legal protection of any sort. So the CFPB has made it clear that that's a jury trial waiver. Um, any waiver of a right to receive a disclosure would, would be picked up. Uh, the CFPB has also said that that will pick up a provision that would um, have the consumer agree that they won't file for bankruptcy protection uh, within a uh, specified number of days because that uh, limits uh, the exercise of that legal right. Um, they haven't mentioned this, but it's unclear whether, given how broadly this is worded, uh, it would pick up common provisions in notes, uh, waiving the right of presentment, protest, and notice of dishonor. Those kinds of provisions are ubiquitous. Uh, certainly, it would, it would also pick up waivers of defenses based on surety ship. Um, those are also commonly appearing in certain kinds of consumer contracts. And then lastly, the provision requiring that a consumer bring any type of legal action in arbitration. Um, and there can be provisions uh, inside the arbitration agreement that would trigger separate reporting as well uh, if they trip one of these other categories. Um, let me stop there and uh, turn it back to Lisa to talk about registration in this context. Well, thank you, John. Um, so before I editorialize on any of this and talk about state-level corollaries, we'll just sort of read through what the registration requirements are. Um, so by the annual registration date each calendar year, as set by the CFPB, the non-bank is required to provide or update identifying or administrative information to the Bureau, um, together with information about its use of covered terms and conditions in the previous calendar year. And we're going to list out some examples on this slide next. Um, this information typically includes consumer financial products and services for which the registrant uses covered terms and conditions. Um, in each state or jurisdiction which the products or services are offered or provided. Um, for each covered form contract entered into various items of information that include the type of covered limitation on consumer legal protections and specified information for each type of limitation that varies with the nature of the limitation um, and whether as a party to any legal action, the registrant obtained one or more court or arbitrator decisions regarding enforceability of a covered term or condition in a covered form contract, and if so, certain information relating to such decisions. Um, so on the state level, we there really isn't a one-to-one -one the same way that we, you know, we just spoke about previously when it comes to disclosure questions and explanations for a registry of orders, right? Um, at the outset, when you apply for a state license or, you know, if you renew your license or you update your contracts, you are in some states required to provide model contracts 
um, that your state regulators can take a look at. They do need to be in compliance with all state law. Typically, that's what they're taking a look at and they'll comment on. Um, you are required to update those periodically, but not on a specified timeline. You're required to update them um, when you, in your record, rather, when you um, update them, if, you know, on an as-needed basis, right? So you, when they become out of date, that's when you update your state regulators. Um, or, you know, some people just sort of set an annual date of, well, when I renew, I'm going to, my license, I'm going to see whether or not my contract is out of date. Um, and I'll update my regulators then. My general comments on this, though, relate more to definitional questions that I have, and I know at least Mike Gordon, we spoke about this earlier, you and I both share. Um, you know, when do you need to tell the CFPB? What, what do you need to tell the CFPB? Um, are you asking the CFPB what it believes it should be regulating? There's too much subjectivity in here. Um, and so we were we were sort of hopeful that as this, progress, right, that there would be more clarity around the what it is that you need to talk to the CFPB about. Um, you know, is there an issue if you don't provide the CFPB with everything that it actually needs when you think that you actually did? Um, and is there a risk of over-disclosure? So those are just sort of the questions that we're kicking around over here um, as we parse through this new registration so a company can submit, you know, in piggybacking off of what we were just saying, you know, questions about, you know, definitional questions, right? A company can submit a notice of non-registration saying that it is not registering because it has a good faith basis to believe that it is not a supervised registrant or that it is not registering terms or conditions contained in a contract because, again, it has a good faith basis to believe that the contract is not a covered form contract or that the terms or conditions are not covered terms or conditions. Um, a supervised registrant is a supervised non-bank, um, not excluded from the registration requirement. So moving along, it's, in its discussion of both proposals, the Bureau states that when a company makes a non-frivolous filing of its good faith belief that it is not required to register, it will not bring an enforcement action based on the company's failure to comply with a registration or attestation requirement unless the Bureau first notified the company that it believed the company did qualify um, as a covered non-bank or supervised registered entity, or that an order does qualify as a covered order or as a supervised reg registrant, or that its contract terms and conditions are covered terms or conditions and has provided the company with a reasonable opportunity to comply. Um, so the way we sort of read it, right, this gives you, in so many words, maybe a get out of jail free card if you if you messed up and you didn't register when you were supposed to register. But I don't know, dealing with many state regulators and the CFPB from time to time, I just am always very skeptical of things like, like that. Um, you know, what is a good faith belief? You know, what what is a non-frivolous filing? These, I have questions about this because the person, it seems to me at least, that's determining this is the person that would like you to register. So it's all, there's always a little bit of bias there that I worry about that things are not, what, what is my understanding of good faith or what is my understanding of something that's not frivolous is not the same as the Bureau's. Um, so again, just more clarity that we need in terms of what these registration requirements are and, and also your state regulators are handling things like this. So is this superfluous? Um, in in my estimation, even though it's not one-to-one, -one, like the disclosure questions and explanations for the registry, it, it does seem to be like an added burden on companies and an unclear one at that. Um, I'll open it up the floor to my colleagues if there's any sort of closing thoughts or remarks. Well, Lisa, um, thank you very much. Um, uh, I guess the, the only two cents I would add to you is um, it would be very difficult, I think, to for us to get into a position of advising a client that they don't have to register if it's in some kind of a gray area. Uh, because if you don't register and, you sh and the CFPB believes that you should have, uh, you're potentially subject to... Uh, in enforcement action. And uh, that, of course, isn't pretty. 
Thanks to all our speakers today, my colleagues in the Consumer Financial Services Group of Ballard Spar, and to make sure that you don't miss our future episodes, subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast platform, be it Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to check out our blog, ConsumerFinanceMonitor.com, for daily insights on the consumer finance industry. And if you have any questions or suggestions for our show, please email us at podcast at ballardspar.com. Thank you for listening and have a good day.